Perfect. Welcome, everyone. Nice to see you all. Great to have so many people on. And uh, it's uh, an honor to be studying this week two parashas, Parashat Vayakel and Pikude. And uh, before we start, we're going to thank tonight's sponsors, uh, as always. So first, uh, we'd like to thank my parents, Mr. and Mrs. Max and Sigi Laredo, who are sponsoring tonight's class as a thanks to HaKadosh Baruch Hu for the recovery of my mother's parents, Gabrielle and Miriam Ifrach. May they live and be well and have a long, healthy, happy life. Um, and my parents are expressing uh, their gratitude for the miracle of, uh, of their recovery, specifically my, uh, well, it was a miracle that my grandmother didn't get it so strong COVID and it was a miracle that my grandfather came out of it, Baruch Hashem, um, in an amazing miracle, miraculous way. Um, next is um, my in-laws, Gad and Sandra Bitoff, for the Refuah Shlema of Simcha Bat Solika. May she have a, the merit of the Refuah Shlema and the merit of the Zer Shimshon and Rev Heyman. Amen. Um, Aviva Diamond, who is dedicating tonight's shiur uh, for the Refuah Shlema, the speedy recovery of Bryna Bat Esther and the merit of the Zer Shimshon and Rev Heyman. Amen. And last but not least, a big Mazal Tov to the new grandparents, the young grandparents, Yehuda and Aviva ben Horin, who are sponsoring tonight's class in honor of their new granddaughter, Rachel Zohara. Uh, Z Z Rachel Zohar. Beautiful, beautiful name. And may they uh, live a long and happy life. And Bizrat Hashem rejoice in all of their grandchildren's milestones, bar mitzvahs, bat mitzvahs, weddings, and Bizrat Hashem, uh, even their own children's smachot. Amen. Bizrat Hashem. Um, so thank you for that. Thank you to all our sponsors. And we are approaching Pesach very, very shortly. We have two weeks and one night until we are going to be doing the Bidikat Chametz, the checking of the Chametz. Towards the end of the class, I'll give a quick synopsis on different halachot for this year because Pesach is starting on a Saturday night on Motzei Shabbat. Um, so stay tuned to the end of the class for us to... Um, go through that portion, Bezrat Hashem. What I want to go through now is I want to start on the Zer Shimshon's uh, Chidush. The topic of tonight's class on the parasha is going to be a similar topic, both for the Zer Shimshon and Rav Ari Leib Heyman, and that is going to be the very, very special, the most special day of the week, and that is Shabbat. So as an introduction, give me a moment to give a little rundown of what's been going on in the past five Torah portions, the five last Torah portions in the book of Exodus, and then we're going to jump into uh, Shabbat in a very, very strong and inspiring way, please God. So the last five Torah portions in the book of Exodus are Chuma, Titzaveh, Kitisa, Vayakel, and then Pikudei. Sometimes we end up reading these two parashas together, like this week, like this year, Sometimes we split them up. This year it's not a it's not a leap year, so we're going to read them together. But I believe next year is a leap year, so we're going to have Vayakel and Pikudei split up. Nevertheless, let me give you a quick synopsis of what goes on in these last five Torah portions um, as a review. So in the parasha of Teruma, the Mishkan fundraising and building directions are given. So Hashem tells Moshe Rabbeinu to fundraise for the Mishkan, and then the directions, the actual building doesn't take place, but the directions of how to build the Mishkan is, is, is commanded. Tetzaveh is the fabrication of Aharon Kohen's garments for service. Aaron and all the Kohanim, we know there's four regular garments plus an extra four for uh, Aharon uh, Kohen Gadol, the high priest. Kitisa speaks about the collecting of the half shekel. This was last week's Torah portion and the infamous sin of the golden calf. This week, we are reading in Parshat Vayakel, the Mishkan fundraising and actual construction, unlike Kitisa, uh, unlike Truma, which was just the directions for the construction. And in Pikudei, it's a summary and put together and a setup of the entire Mishkan. So, uh, may, some of these parashas are quite repetitive, especially Vayakel and and uh, Truman Tetzaveh do have a lot of similarities, but 
Um, the Torah did spend an extensive amount of time detailing the Mishkan and its service and how it shall be constructed and conducted. Right, take, take a look at your screen. Where is it? Here we go. So this is the beginning of this week's Torah portion. This is in Exodus chapter 35, verse 1. And it goes as follows. Vayakel Moshe et kol adat b'nei Yisrael. And Moshe, he calls, he actually gathers from the terminology, terminology of kehila, la'kel. Vayakel Moshe et kol adat b'nei Yisrael. He gathers all the Jewish people, vayomer alehem, and he tells them, Ele ha'devarim, these are the things, asher tziva Hashem la'asot otam. These are the things that the Lord commanded to make. What did he intend? He was intending on telling the Jewish people exactly how to build the Mishkan, the tabernacle. Takes a huge pause. And before getting into that, he throws in this verse. This is in chapter 35, verse 2. Six days of the week we shall work. On the seventh day, however, shall be a day of holiness. Shabbat Shabbaton Lashem a day of complete rest for Hashem, kol ha'osebo melacha yumat, whoever performs a melacha, which is work, something prohibited on Shabbat, shall be put to death. That severe is the punishment of one who desecrates the Shabbat. Now, the Zer Shimshon uh, addresses two different aspects. So, well, it's really the same, and, and I'm going to give both of his answers. This is the very first portion of the Zer Shimshon on this week's Torah portion. And he wants to know, why is it that Moses decides right now to warn the Jewish people about keeping Shabbat? Why now is number one. And number two is, why this mitzvah? It seems out of order. It seems like Moses is getting ready the Zer Shimshon reminds us that this assembly, this Vayakel, was the following day after Yom Kippur, the 11th day of Tishrei. What happened on Yom Kippur, since the Jewish people left Egypt, was the day that they finally, after 80 days of supplication, Moses on behalf of the Jewish people, were finally forgiven for the sin of the golden calf. That was Yom Kippur. Next day, Moses comes and he tells them, God told me this is how we're going to achieve our perfect and hopefully everlasting atonement. And it's going to be through the Mishkan. So he gathers them. He tells them, this is what we're going to do. Pause. I want to warn you about a special mitzvah, the mitzvah of Shabbat. So Zesh Shimshon wants to know, why now? Why the pause? Like, what, what's the urgency? Secondly, out of all mitzvot that he wants to use, to reiterate its importance, why is he choosing the mitzvah of Shabbat? So Rashi, first of all, tells us one part. Rashi tells us that a person might think, I think we mentioned this last week, a person might think that, oh, the construction of the temple, of the Mishkan of the tabernacle is so important that maybe it overrides Shabbat observance maybe we should be building and constructing the Mishkan even on Shabbat, not just six days as they had, uh, uh, six days a week as they had a mandate and a commandment to do, but even on the seventh, even on Shabbat. Therefore, Rashi says, Moshe Rabbeinu tells the Jewish people, stop, on sh six days you work, seventh you rest. So what was the rush? The Zer Shimshon wants to know. Was there a rush for the Jewish people to get this Mishkan built? Well, it seems like yes, but he reminds us not. We've learned this Midrash over the past couple of years more than once. So I'm sure our veterans, our regulars will remember this Midrash. It's a very famous Midrash. The Midrash tells us that in truth, the Mishkan finished being built on the 25th of Kislev. The 25th of Kislev is a very special day of the year. That's the first day of Hanukkah. But mind you, this happened. Uh, I'm, I'm giving. I'm, I'm, I don't have a. I don't have a timeline in front of me. But this is over a thousand years before, before uh, the Hanukkah miracle. 
Nevertheless, it was completed on the 25th day of Kislev. So if we backtrack, the 11th of, of, uh, of, of Tishrei was when Hashem and Moses commanded everyone to, do, to, to get the Mishkan going. It took them two days to fundraise till Moses had to come and say, stop, we have enough. And then the next 72 days, which brings us to the 25th of Kislev, was how long it took them to actually put together the Mishkan, build all of its components. 72 days. Two days of fundraising, 72 days of construction. Very good. Tells us the Midrash. Do you know that the day that they inaugurated the Mishkan, that they actually built it and put together and started using it, was not on the 25th of Kislev. Rather, it was, it's going to be, corresponding to this weekend to or actually next week to Rosh Chodesh Nisan. The first day of Nisan is when the Mishkan actually was erected and used for the first time in its service. So the Zer Shimshon says, what's the rush? Why would a Jew, why would Ben Israel back then think that they have to build the Mishkan seven days a week, not six days a week, if anyways, there was such a long wait until the Mishkan was being put up? This is Zeresh Shimshon's question. So he says is this. He says, the Jewish people may have thought, okay, so just, just to, as a side note, the reason why the Mishkan was waited to be put up till, Nis, till Nisan is because that was when Yitzhak Avinu's birthday was. So to invoke Yitzhak Avinu's um, se- uh, commitment and self-sacrifice to, uh, as he displayed during the Akedat Yitzhak with his father, uh, we waited till then Hashem wanted to invoke that uh, for the Jewish people. So what happened is, is that the Jewish people, says Zer Shimshon says, the Jewish people may have thought that since the Mishkan is so important, of course not during the preparation and the building of it, may one come to break Shabbat in order to construct it. That everyone knew. It's an obvious, as we just said, there wasn't even a rush to put it together. But what happened if there would need to be any type of repair or renovation once the Mishkan or the Bet HaMikdash would, have, would be already in service and built and being used? Maybe one would say, since it is so important to serve Hashem in the Mishkan, in the tabernacle, or in the temple, maybe we should go and fix it even if it's on Shabbat, renovate or update or whatever the case maintenance is comes Moshe Rabbeinu and says, even in the future, one should not desecrate the Shabbat in order to maintain, upkeep, or renovate the Mishkan or the Bet HaMikdash. This is the Zer Shimshon's first answer. We'll go on to the second one in a moment, but based on this, I want to share a short lesson. The lesson is as follows. The Talmud says, whoever cooks for Shabbat will eat on Shabbat. Because you can't cook on Shabbat. So if you want to eat on Shabbat, you got to cook before Shabbat. And that's just a metaphor to a greater, larger scheme and a more important lesson. And that is whoever cooks, so to say, in this world, whoever prepares themselves by filling themselves up with Torah and mitzvot in this world, will be able to eat in the world to come, will be able to enjoy the merit that they are deserved and the reward that they are deserving of in the world to come. This world is like the weekdays. The, it's, the, it's, the, it's the time for us to work hard and to put in our efforts. And the world to come is like Shabbat. It's um, Yom Shekulo Shabbat. It's a everlasting day of Shabbat, that is Mashiach, and that is the world to come. So for that reason, the lesson I would like to bring out from this is that a person should realize that just as when we come to the Shabbat table, whether you prepared it yourself, or you helped your spouse do it, or you toiled hard to pay to buy whatever it is that you're eating or enjoying from on Shabbat, so too we have to understand that we have to put an emphasis and toil and work hard on that which will give us our reward and our merit in the world to come. So that's the first answer to Zer Shimshon. In all honesty, amazing answer, short to the point. The second answer, I think, is, 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 is much deeper and much richer, um, as you'll see in a moment. So 
again to reiterate the question, why does Moses pause now to give them a different lesson? And why specifically the lesson of Shabbat? Take a look at the following. The Zeshim Shon quotes the Talmud in Masechet Shabbat, page 118b, that says that the Jewish people, unfortunately, did not complete fulfilling and observing the very first Shabbat that they were given. When was this? This was the Shabbat right after they emerged from the Yamsuf, from the Sea of Reeds. And at that point, the Jewish people, they complained that they were hungry. So what did Hashem do? He sent them man, manna, the wonder bread. And a one of the rules with the manna, right, there, was, there were several of them. One of the rules of the manna was on Friday, go out and pick double because on Shabbat, there's not going to be any. Don't go out and take some on, on Shabbat because there won't be any there. But go pull it out. Go take double the portion on Friday. Why? Because you're not allowed to carry. One of the prohibitions that there are on Shabbat is you're not allowed to carry unless there is an eruv, an enclosure. Whether it's a house, whether it's a fence, whether it's uh, anything that halachically qualifies as some type of boundary. So for that reason, nothing came, no, no man fell on Shabbat. So this way people would not have to transport the man from the field, from wherever they found it, all the way into their homes. What happened that very first Shabbat, two Jews, Datan and Aviram, the infamous two Jews who were challenging God and Moses on and on. They went out and they put bread there. They put the manna there to make you look, ah, you see, Moshe Rabbeinu is not for real. He's not telling us the truth. Some fell. Now we know that the birds came and ate it, but nevertheless, those two Jews desecrated Shabbat because they transported from in their houses out to the field. Says the Gemara, the Talmud and Masechet Shabbat, that because the Jewish people never fulfilled, never observed fully as a complete unit, the very first Shabbat, this gave power for the other nations to dominate over them. And if they would have fulfilled the very first Shabbat, the Jewish people would have had never any adversaries that could have overcome them at all. The Gemara further states that anyone who keeps Shabbat in, with all of its laws, meaning everything that you've learned and you know about it and you fulfill it properly, even if the individual worships idols, as in the generation of Enosh, Enosh the grandson, the grandson of Adam Arishon, all of the person's sins will be forgiven. Idolatry, which is one of the three cardinal sins, one which God has absolutely no toleration for, cannot at all. Still, if a person is diligent in observing Shabbat, they will be forgiven. The Zeshim Shon brings another piece of Talmud. The Talmud is in Masachet Abu Dazara, page 5a. The Talmud says that if the Jewish people would not have committed the sin of the golden calf, also there would have been no nation that would have any ability to dominate over them. So the Zeshim Shon wants to know why. Why is this? Why is it that if the Jewish people would have kept Shabbat the first time, no nation could have dominated over them? And why is it that if the Jewish people would have not sinned with the golden calf, no nation could have dominated over them? He quotes the, the, the Pasuk. This is in chapter 32 in Exodus, verse 16. And it may be found on your screen. The tablets, the two tablets, the Ten Commandments on them, were tablets that were God's work. And the inscription was also an inscription of God. Harut al Aluchot, they were engraved on the tablets. This word, the Zerashim Shon pays attention to, Harut, which literally means engraved, can also, without the Nekudot, be read as Cherut. Cherut for any of our Hebrew speaking guests on tonight's class understand that cherut means freedom. Charut means engraved, same letters. 
Cherut means freedom. Explains Ezer Shimshon that one who keeps the Torah, that which was engraved, is making them free, free from any other type of enslavement and, and hardship and oppression from any others. When a person heeds to that which it says in the Torah, specifically the Ten Commandments, commandments which includes not ser serving and worshiping idols and observing the Shabbat, what they are doing is they are freeing themselves, cherut, freedom. They are freeing themselves from any other oppression or domination. Moshe Rabbeinu was pleading for the Jewish people, as we said earlier, for 80 days. Finally, Yom Kippur, he was forgiven. You know, the first message he wanted to give the Jewish people, the first warning, Shabbat. Why Shabbat? because Moshe wanted them to understand how important Shabbat is. He wanted them to know how sad it was that they weren't able to fulfill and observe that first Shabbat. It would have avoided everything. It would have avoided the sin, the golden calf. It would have avoided the whole concept of Yom Kippur. Can you imagine, listen to what Zer Shimshon says, I would not be able to say it if he did not write this. He writes that if the Jewish people would have observed that very first Shabbat, there would be no concept of prayer. We would not need to pray. We would not have to bring any sacrifices ever. There would never be any danger, danger that befalls the Jewish people. There would be no such thing and no concept of Yom Kippur and Teshuvah. It would have led us into the Yom Shekulo Shabbat, the everlasting day of Shabbat, if they would have fulfilled that very first Shabbat. It's a very, very serious point as Hashem Shan is bringing a, a cross over here. Moses is telling the Jewish people, at least protect your future. You know how you will protect your future? By observing the Sabbath. By observing Shabbat. Observing Shabbat, says the Talmud in Masechet Shabbat, brings the Geulah, brings redemption. The everlasting redemption. The Talmud says, if the Jewish people would keep two Shabbats, observe two Shabbats as a whole, Mashiach would come right away. Now there's different opinions. Is it two in a row? Or is it that second Shabbat, right? The Jewish people kept the second Shabbat. The first Shabbat was the Tanan Aviram. They messed that up. The second Shabbat they kept. Then, unfortunately, it was downhill from there. Not everyone kept it anymore. Do we need one more Shabbat altogether, or do we still need two? Nevertheless, it's only two Shabbats in total that would bring Mashiach immediately, that which we have been all waiting for for thousands of years. Moshe wanted them to focus on Shabbat. He didn't want them to overlook that important mitzvah. He wanted them to know, you know why we even have this Mishkan? to make up for the sin of the golden calf is because Shabbat was not kept diligently. Moshe was telling them this now. Right now he was telling them this Mishkan, before this Mishkan, before the tabernacle, understand that Mishkan comes from the terminology of Mashko and a collateral. Hashem is just giving this to us as a collateral that unfortunately if we do sin, he'll take it away from us like we've had unfortunately. But prior to all of this, more important than anything else, the Zer Shimshon says, Moshe was giving them a speech, a message, a warning about Shabbat, how Shabbat will preserve the temple from being destroyed, preserve our Jewish families in surviving, in surviving the exiles and eventually being redeemed. So the lesson I want to share with you all based on the Zer Shimshon is remembering the reason why Hashem commanded us to observe Shabbat is to be like Him, to emulate Him. That the same way God created the world in six days and He rested on the seventh, we are to also, by us keeping Shabbat, by us not working on Shabbat, we are testifying in the creation of the world, that it was done by God himself. Melacha, 
the famous word for work, prohibited actions on Shabbat, is not hard work. It's creation. Because God ceased from creating. God ceased from on the seventh day, whatever he was doing on the first six days. Was God working hard on the first six days? No, God can't work hard. There's no such thing as hard for God. God created. And then he ceased from creating. So we are to cease from creating on the seventh day of the week, just as God did. Where do we learn what creating is? From the Mishkan. That's why it's juxtaposed over here. All of the actions that the Jewish people went into creating the Mishkan based on Hashem's directives, that's where we learn what we're not allowed to do on Shabbat. But what can we do? We can all learn more about Shabbat. We can take small steps in the right direction, which is, I, I always repeat, is all that counts. Small steps in the right direction. Do we understand how Shabbat preserves us as a nation and as a family unit? What would our lives look like? What would our families look like if we did not have that 25-hour recharge every single week where we're able to come together with our family, with our friends, with our community, but specifically our family, and share about our weeks, share about our goals and aspirations, share in spirituality, share in physicality, as we learned last week, is an important aspect of Shabbat as well, that we're not held accountable for. Rather, we're just given complete blessing for it. When else would we have that routine and that opportunity? And that's why there are many families, even if they're not able to observe Shabbat properly or 100%, because they're still learning. But many families understand, many traditional families understand the importance of coming together Friday night for the meal and Shabbat morning, Shabbat lunchtime for the meal. The Shabbat meals is what keeps the family together. The Shabbat as a whole is what keeps the Jewish people together together. Committed to God, refocusing our goals, making sure that we are always traveling in the right direction, which is the direction of being closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So this is what I wanted to share from you from the Zashim Shan on this week's Torah portion.